Uh, we may not build altars to false gods, but I think sometimes the things that we do build or that we do have in our churches can often become altars to our gods of selfishness and pride. Um, you know, I think about when, uh, whether it's like a, a pulpit or the color of the carpet or the color of the walls or some tradition we have and. And when I see churches fighting over such unimportant issues, it really reveals the idols that we've created in our own hearts. Don't you think so? And um, so Manasseh, he worshipped false gods. And when a group like Israel forgets their purpose and their mission, um, they're very easily led astray. And so they they followed suit, and they also participated in Manasseh's sins, and he led them to just a new level of sinfulness that was really ridiculously low. And, um, you know, he even... It's almost hard to imagine this, but Manasseh sacrificed his own son... He, he, had a, he burned him alive um, as a sacrifice to a false god. That's pretty pathetic. It's pretty awful. And um, so Israel's sin that just continued to multiply. Now, one of the amazing things about Manasseh is that at one point, he actually eventually repented. <laughs> and God had mercy on him and grace. But it didn't last, okay? Um, because for every good king that they found, there were multiple rotten ones. And eventually, um, God had just had enough. I mean, they, they would sin and sin and sin, and then they would run back to, they would prostitute themselves to false gods, and then they would run back to God whenever they wanted help. And we see that in, uh, if you remember, we read, we read that in Jeremiah 2.27. They say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, you gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. And so eventually, God had just kind of had enough. Um, do you ever reach, have you ever played Jenga? And you reach that point, right, where it's just, oh, where you know that uh, you're treading on thin ice, right? And, and something's going to give. And eventually, um, Israel, they continue to multiply their sins And let me tell you, God's grace and his mercy, they're good. But eventually it just becomes too much. And that's what happened with Israel until... Oh, this is really like the story of the Bible, isn't it? The story of Israel. You keep thinking, oh, he's about to do it. He's about to do it. And then he just says, you know what? I've got a little bit more patience left for you. I've got a little bit more mercy left. And uh, I think Israel kept relying on that. But eventually, there's no more to give. And they fell. Then they fell hard. And um, another nation came in and took over and conquered them and, and carried them off and destroyed almost everything. In God's temple. And uh, so we're just going to leave that there. That's an image that you can have the rest of the message of Israel falling. Um, and during this vicious cycle of destruction, God sent two prophets. 
and their names were Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And um, now one of the things that I want to clarify before we jump into the passage is what a prophet is, okay? Because a lot of times when people think about a prophet in Scripture, they, they pictured this person that like told the future, right? But that's not really what a prophet did, okay? The, the job of a prophet is very simple. They were messengers of God, okay? And so they just told, they relayed the message, right? Whatever God told them, they told the people. And so if it was about the future, then that's what they did. And, uh, but what we often fail to realize is that really most of the prophecies in Scripture are not like about the distant future, Okay, and some of them are, but many of them are about the, the immediate future. You know, like uh, you, you can tell a prophecy about like this is about to happen if you do this or don't do this or whatever. Kind of like when my son Judah um, holds up a toy bat with that look in his face of like, I'm going to swing this and I'm going to hit you <laughs> or my sister. <laughs> and. You know, and we tell him, Judah, do not swing that bat. If you do hit one of us or if you do hit your sister, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> that, that's a prophecy <laughs> about the immediate future, right? And, and so sometimes they were, many times they were like that, and sometimes they weren't about the future at all. And so we have, we have these prophets, these messengers named Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And um, I want to look at... I want to focus on God's initial call to them today and when God gave them their commission. And I think we'll see some really interesting things in their commissions and also how much their commissions relate to our commission today and what we can learn. And so before we jump into the passage, uh, I want to just pray for us and then we'll get right in. God, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for men like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, as as we see men that uh, followed you despite some very difficult situations around them. And I pray that as we dig into your word today, that we would see our own commission, that we would see... um, that your command of telling us to go and make disciples, has n- there, there are no conditions involved in that. And, and I pray that today it wouldn't just be hearing, that it wouldn't be an evaluation of me, but that it would be just be submitting to your word and letting you change us and sending us out to to bring glory to you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to be first looking at God's initial call on Ezekiel. And um, that entire call is found in Ezekiel chapter 2. But what we're going to focus on is uh, verses 3 through 7. And so Ezekiel 2, 3 through 7 is where I'm going to be focused now. There's going to be quite a few words up on the screen in a second, (laughs) and so if you can't see them very well, then please, you know, feel free to open up your Bible. You'll see why I put them all up together. Um, So if we jump in, we say, Ezekiel 2, 3 through 7, this is God speaking to Ezekiel. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them. Though they are a rebellious people, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. Uh, So, 
I noticed some repetition in this passage. Um, <laughs> I don't, in case you didn't, I, I took the liberty of highlighting a few things. And if you, I think you guys have notes in your bulletins, right? Um, and so the first things that I want to look at, as God is calling Ezekiel, he's saying, I want you to go and be my messenger to these people. Take my word to these people. And God describes the people that he wants Ezekiel to go to. And so maybe you'll notice some describing words about these people. Let's take a look at some of those. Rebellious. Okay? He says they are rebellious. They have rebelled. (laughs) They've been in revolt against me. Uh, They are obstinate. They are stubborn. They are rebellious. Uh, Let's see. He describes them as briars and thorns and scorpions. And again, he says they're rebellious. They are rebellious. A little bit of repetition. (laughs) God, God is adamant about, hey, Ezekiel, these people that I want you to go to, they're Really, really awful. (laughs) They are rebellious. They are terrible. And he says it over and over and over. And I use red highlighting for these because every one of these words is like a big red flag for Ezekiel to say like, this is a good reason for me not to go to these people. Uh, You know, he can just respond to God like, thanks God for giving me so many good reasons not to go to these people. (laughs) But what does God say instead? He says three times here, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And despite how terrible God described the people that he wanted Ezekiel to go to, he was also adamant that Ezekiel had no need to fear them. And so we see, um, and and we'll get to the later part of the notes, uh, the ending part later, but we see here that God is showing Ezekiel that his commission to go to these people is not conditional on the condition of the audience. And not only is it not conditional on the condition of the audience, but it's also not conditional on the response of the audience. Twice, whether they listen or fail to listen. Again, whether they listen or fail to listen. And we think about someone having to go to such a dangerous and scary group of people and take God's word to them. And we think, well, that might be okay if we know that they're going to repent. But God says, no, there's no guarantee about that. In fact, God knew very well that they weren't going to. And he sends them anyway. He says, whether they listen or fail to listen. And what does he say? No matter what, you must speak my words to them. You must. Hmm. I think that's powerful. And uh, God made it clear that the people Ezekiel we're going to, we're not the ideal audience, okay? This was a group of people that had a reputation for not listening to the Lord, okay? They were, you could describe them as foolish. Um, And fools have a hard time listening, don't they? (laughs) Have you ever had conversations with foolish people? Um, I've always liked Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. This is a fun set of verses Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. And a lot of times people read that and they think, well, that's that's contradictory. And well, it's not contradictory because it's Proverbs, and what Proverbs is is wisdom. And this is wisdom. And you know what this wisdom says? You can't win with fools. (laughs) I mean, have you ever had a conversation... And you're talking to, to a fool, and, and you just start playing it out in your head. You're like, if I answer you, then you're probably just going to say something else that's stupid. 
And then I'm going to have to respond to that stupid thing. Um, and then you think to yourself, if I don't answer you, you might actually think that you're right. <laughs> and so you play out the two scenarios in your head, and you realize there's no winning with, <laughs> with you. It's not going to work out either way. And Israel, they were a foolish and stubborn people. And, but that didn't matter to God's commission on Ezekiel. Ezekiel's commission wasn't dependent on how good or bad the audience was or on how well they would receive the message. It didn't matter if they were rapists or murderers or fools or gluttons or homosexuals or thieves. Ezekiel was given a command. You must speak my words to them. And in the midst of this difficult command, God reminds Ezekiel that you have no reason to fear them. But how could Ezekiel not be afraid to take God's word to such a stubborn and violent and volatile and foolish people because God was with him. God was with Ezekiel and he was going to give him the strength that he needed to take his word. And I think it's important for all of us to know that God has spoken similarly to all of us. Now, we do need to remember that when we're reading about God's commission to Ezekiel, those were words given to Ezekiel, right? And I think sometimes we get, um, I think sometimes we make the mistake of reading scripture and um, reading it like every, especially in the Old Testament, like everything's written directly to us. I think a better way to phrase it is it's all written for us. But it's not necessarily all written to us, you know. And so we're reading a commission to Ezekiel. And God says, do not be afraid of them. But we also see in God's word that he has spoken to all of his children in similar ways. And I wanted to share some of those verses with you. 2 Timothy 1.7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You know, the spirit that God gives us is not one of fear. In uh, Matthew 10, 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Again, 1 Peter 3, 13 and 14, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. And so we see that God has given his comfort and his strength to all of his children so that we don't have to be afraid of, of people. Did you notice that? In Ezekiel's commission and in these verses, and we'll also see in Jeremiah's, God never really says that you shouldn't have any fear in you. But he says, you know who you shouldn't fear? You shouldn't fear them. But we do need to fear God. That's a good fear, an appropriate fear. And you know what? We need to fear what it means to God when we don't make disciples, when we don't live out our commission, when we don't take the words to the people that he's called us to go to. That's what we need to be afraid of. And so let's take a look at Jeremiah's commission as well. That's in Jeremiah chapter 1, and I'm going to be focused on verses 6 through 8. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So again, uh, God is... He has been telling Jeremiah, like, hey, I formed you, and before you existed, I had a plan for you. And, and he's telling him that you need to go to these people. And what does Jeremiah do? 
he tries to come up with an excuse, right? Now, that's not the first time somebody tried to come up with an excuse to follow God's command on their life. I'm not good enough, said Moses. I won't have answers to their questions, said Moses. What if they won't listen, said Moses. I'm not a good speaker, said Moses. My family is nothing, said Gideon. I need more proof, said Gideon. I'm too young, said Jeremiah. I'm too old, said Sarah. I don't want these people to be saved, said Jonah. I need to bury my father first, said Jesus' disciple. God had an answer for every excuse ever proposed to him. And all of those excuses never changed the fact that he had given a command. And last week, Pastor Toby laid forth our command out of Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so we, we, we saw God's commission on our lives, but we come up with excuses too, don't we? Just like people in the scripture, we're not any different. I'm too old. I'm too young. It's like, <laughs> is there like a 10-year part of your life when you can be effective at making disciples or something? Uh, I'm not gifted in that area. Mm. They won't listen anyway. Those people are too dangerous. I won't know how to answer their questions. And on and on and on we go with our excuses. But God's command hasn't changed. It's still sitting there right there in Matthew 28. It's not going anywhere. It's not changing. And so I want to look at what we see in Ezekiel and Jeremiah's commission that we also find to be true of our own commission. Okay, our commission to go is not conditional on the difficulty of the audience. It doesn't matter how far away they are, how hard they are to reach, how stubborn they are, how dangerous they are, how different they are. Our commission to go is not conditional on anything about the audience. And our commission to go is not conditional on our own adequacy. It doesn't matter how busy we feel we are, how in, in, unprepared we feel, how scared we feel, how uncomfortable we feel. It's not conditional on that. Our commission to go and make disciples is not conditional on whether or not anyone will ever listen to us. If we preach the gospel to 100 people every day for 10 years and nobody ever repents, our commission has not changed. It doesn't change. It stays the same. We must go. And so really we see that our commission to go and make disciples is not conditional on anything. Period. It's not conditional. And so what does this mean for us? Or what do we do with this information? Well, for one thing, folks, we have to stop pretending like making disciples is optional as a Christian. Uh, I'm going to... My lovely wife, Leslie, is going to come up here and uh, help me out for a little uh, demonstration. You know, uh, a follower of Christ that doesn't make disciples is like a farmer that doesn't grow anything. Okay? All right. Yeah, I'm a farmer. Uh, what do you grow? No, I don't grow nothing. Why do you call yourself a farmer? Well, I have a farmhouse. I read the farmer's almanac. 
I go to the farmer's market. I subscribe to farming magazines. One time when I was a kid, I decided to call myself a farmer. Okay, I think I understand. Okay. And we, we, we think about a scenario like that, and we think, someone like that is crazy. But do we recognize how crazy we are when we call ourselves a follower of Christ, but we don't make disciples? You're a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah. Did you make disciples? Well, um, well, well no, I mean, no, I mean. Oh, well, that's easy. I mean, I go to a Christian church. You know, I I listen to Christian music. uh, I read Christian books. I watch Christian movies. I I give to Christian causes. I I subscribe to Christian magazines. One time when I was a kid, I walked down an aisle and and I said a prayer. And and ever since then, I've, you know, called myself a Christian. If that is our life, then we're like a farmer that doesn't farm, a runner that doesn't run, a chef that doesn't cook. If we call ourselves a follower of Christ, but we don't follow Christ and make disciples, then our life is a contradiction. And that may sound harsh, but it's just, it's just the truth. You know, it's, it just is that way. If we just come here and learn things in our head and, and eat together and fellowship together, but we don't make disciples, then this is all just a big waste of time and money. But my intention this morning is not I mean, I have to back off a little bit and say, like, my intention is not to just beat anybody up. I mean, you know, God has told us that we don't need to be afraid to do what he's called us to do. You know, and, and we can do it. We don't have to fear. He's with us. And, I mean, sometimes, I mean, sometimes any of us, myself included, sometimes we do just need a kick in the butt, don't we? Or we just need to be woken up because maybe, maybe we're just completely asleep or maybe we're just dozing a little bit and we're kind of scooting through life and we're not really making disciples and we just need a little, a little shake. Because that's what we have to do. That's the entire point of our existence. And so, you know, we talked about It's true. God tells us we don't need to fear people when we take his word to the world. But we do need to have a proper fear of God. Uh, Last week in Sunday school, the question came up about what kind of consequences we face when we fail to follow God's will in our life, when we fail to follow God in our life, you know. And I want to give you just a moment to, to think about that question. You know, if, if you fail to follow God, what are the consequences? Uh, like, and that could be now, that could be earlier on in life. If you uh, didn't follow God early in your life, what were the consequences? Or if you did, but you hadn't, think about what would the consequences have been had you not followed God earlier in your life? I want you to just just think about that for a second, because I, I really want you to kind of come up with an answer in your head. And think about, you know, don't think about how you're supposed to answer, but just think about, you know, what, how would you really answer that question? And I think often we go directly to the consequences that we endure, Right? You know, if we had chosen not to follow God earlier in life, then we think about all the hardships that we had to endure because of our bad choices that we made, right? And we think about all the things that we have to go through and all the things that we face. Uh, You know, one person might think, 
about uh, since they had ignored the Lord's direction in their life, they had to endure a bad relationship or they had to go through these difficult times and our instincts take us to what we missed out on. But that's not the real tragedy of ignoring God's commands in our life. The real tragedy is that God misses out on glory. That's the tragedy. Whenever I focus on myself and I fail to share the gospel with someone that I meet, that that I know that I could have shared the gospel with, the real tragedy isn't that I have to go home feeling down and guilty because I messed up. The real tragedy is that I missed an opportunity to bring God glory and to magnify his name. The real tragedy whenever a a believer uh, makes a fool of themselves at their kids' sporting events because of their anger. The real tragedy is not that they have to deal with all the awkwardness and embarrassment involved in that scenario. The real tragedy is that Jesus' name took a hit that day because that person associates themselves with Christ, and now the other people that don't associate their behavior with Christ. The real benefit, uh, students, if you choose to follow God's commission on your life right now as you're young, the, the wonderful thing about that is not that you won't get pregnant or go to jail or drop out of school. It's that you will give God more glory and praise in your life than if you don't follow him. And you can bring others along with you. That's how we bring God more glory, is that we bring more people bringing him glory. And so we we need to stop fearing people, but we need to start fearing God. Because we've been given a command, and we must speak God's message to this world. Under none condition. That was the title of my message at the beginning, if you remember that. It wasn't a typo. <clears throat> it's, it's bad English. <laughs> but it wasn't a typo. Under none condition, because that's what we see in Ezekiel and Jeremiah's commissions, and that's what we see in our commission, is that it is not conditional. That's what we're here to do. And that is what I want to help us to do. And so, uh, you know, my sermons, they tend to be on the convicting and challenging side, but I also have to remind us, like, God is with us. We don't have to fear. And, And my role in this church, I want to help you do this, you know, if you're having trouble figuring out how in the world do I talk to these guys that I work with or these gr- people that I work with, I don't know how to get the gospel into these conversations, then take me to work with you. Let's figure it out. You know, if you have a job where you, somebody can come along for the day, then take me with you. You know, if you're like, I, I want my kids to follow Christ, but I just, I'm having trouble finding the time. I'm having trouble knowing how to teach them at home. Because parents, you got to realize that the church is not the primary discipler of your children. You are. And the answer is not to sit back and say, well, I just don't know how to do it. The answer is, come and say, I'm having trouble doing it. and Let's figure it out together. We'll figure it out. So whatever it is, just know that you have... For one thing, you have God saying, you don't need to fear them. You don't need to fear those people that you're afraid to talk to. Whatever their response might be, whatever their threats might be, you don't need to fear them. You, you have God. And, and I'm happy to say that, that you also have me. I'm not as good as God, but I'll do my best. Um, and so I hope that uh, hope this is what we go on with I mean we, we have to move forward now 
and just knowing like this is what our life is about. We take God's message to the world under none condition. Let's pray. God, I thank you for being a God who is in control, who is powerful enough to say, no matter what circumstances you're facing, no matter what kind of person I'm sending you to or group of people, like you don't have to worry because I'm in control. And um, you know, we, we don't serve a, a wimpy God. We serve a powerful God. And because of that, it should lead us to not fear people. But we're crazy if we don't fear you, because you are powerful. And, and God, I hate to think of all the glory that I've robbed you of when I've failed to take your name, the people that needed it. And I'm sorry for that. I don't want to do that. And I hope that nobody in here wants to do that, God. I just, we, you know, we've all done it at some point. And just forgive us and help us to come together and work together to not let that happen. And we ask this in your son's most precious holy name. <laughs>